Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the planet Earth, the John Campia Show, coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia. It is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, my international friends, join around and gather around the virtual water coolers. We talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, some television, all sorts of good stuff. And joining me on this glorious Friday, congratulations, everybody, for making it through to the end of another week, is one Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing, sir? John, I am just it's fantastic to be here today on a Friday, you know. Uh, I've really been enjoying January 2020 so far, and a lot of that's due to you. Well, oh, thank you so much, and it has been a great January 2020, and I think I speak for Rob as well when I say it is all due to you guys, so thank you for making this a great January so far. Hey, listen, guys, we've got a, a lot of stuff going on here. I'm going to give you a heads up, though. It's a little bit of a warning. When we tried to start the show today, YouTube said live streaming is not currently available. And then we got it working. So I don't know if this show is suddenly going to disappear halfway through the show or not. If so, our deepest apologies in advance. Listen, guys, we have a lot of stuff that we need to talk about here today. The Banker is actually now coming out. Apple TV has talked about that. We'll talk about that controversy a little bit. I'm going to give you my review. Uh, of Dr. Doolittle, also known just as Doolittle. The producers of James Bond has something to say about whether Bond can ever be a woman. It looks like Mindhunter may not be coming back as a TV series. Taika Waititi has been approached by Lucasfilm to direct the next Star Wars film. We'll get to all that and more, but before we do, we need to go right off the top with a couple things, and let's start off with this. Rob, one of the big, fun, you know, releva uh, relevations of a show this year that a lot of us had a lot of question marks about but it turned out pretty damn great, is Watchmen. Watchmen turned out a lot better than I thought it would. I, I, I mean, I thought the ending of it could have been a little better, but overall, I thought the season was fantastic. It won a lot of people over, and great. And so, with that kind of success, it seems like a no-brainer, at least in the movie world it would be, that you're going to prep up for the sequel. You're getting ready for season two. Well, Rob, according to reports... It's looking that Watchmen Season 2 is not going to happen. They're saying Damon Lindelof has walked off. The report uh, is saying this. Now, this comes out of USA Today, but of course, we're pulling this from our friends over at Coming Soon. According to the USA Today, Watchmen will probably not see a second season at HBO after creator Damon Lindelof announced that he was not interested in pursuing a season two. Lindelof told the outlet that with the first season of Watchmen, he told the story that he wanted to tell, but has given his blessing to the network if they were interested in doing another season. However, HBO programming chief uh, Casey uh, Bloys wrote the following. It would be hard for us to imagine doing a season two without Damon Lindelof involved in some way, making the second season highly unlikely. Rob, I know that this Watchmen series for you was a little bit of a roller coaster, right? Like you didn't know what to make yes. of it before it came out. Then you were very perplexed by it when it did come out. Then it totally won you over for a while. And, and you it was an emotional role. It was it was it a really storm was. of emotions for you. Um, hearing that they're probably not going to do a second season. And by the way, nothing's been said definitively. But seeing this type of report, do you think this is the right move? Are you surprised? I'll be honest, I'm shocked, but do you think are you surprised by this? How are you feeling about this? Well, Lindelof was very clear that he was only going to do one season of this show. He said it from the beginning. He said it in many different interviews. So it doesn't surprise me. And he said, he flat out said, if somebody else wants to come along and tell a, a new story, I could see that happening. But, you know, HBO has a relationship, as, as many networks do, with showrunners themselves. And Lindelof coming off of The Leftovers, the three seasons of The Leftovers, which was highly regarded. Um, and then also... Uh, uh, that he flat out said, I'm telling what I have one story to tell and I'm going to do it. So I'm surprised that no one has been there to take up the baton. I would have thought that maybe Lindelof would have had a protege or somebody else who would come in. But, you know, to be honest, for whatever faults you might say that the Watchmen had, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, John, because I am no fan of Lindelof's work. I thought what he did was audacious, ballsy. I don't think it worked a lot of the time, but it did work enough of the time where I was I was I was glued to the screen. And I spent a lot of time 
sometimes in seething anger and sometimes in admiration over each episode of Watchmen. But I'll tell you one thing, it certainly was compelling viewing. And I have to say, I give it up to Damon Lindelof. I will be sorry to see no more Watchmen. Yeah, I have to believe that cooler heads are going to prevail and they will do a second season at some point. I, I mean, I just have to believe that they will. They stumbled on something that I think surprised even them how well it turned out. And I just got to believe that the business part of this has got to at some point come out and say, this just worked too well for us not to do another one. And maybe Lindelof doesn't come back. And you know what? By the way, full kudos to Damon Lindelof as a creator. If he's at a point that he's like, hey, I've told the story I wanted to tell. I This is all I wanted to do. And he's not going to force himself to do more. Hats off to him. That's great. But right. that doesn't mean as a network, when you're sitting on this incredible property that people are liking. And by the way, in an environment where you've got Netflix, we're going to talk about them in a second, is pouring every cent they've got into new content. You've got Disney Plus now on the market. That stupid NBC named network Peacock is going to be launching here pretty soon. Apple TV is cranking out content, all this kind of stuff. When you've got that type of environment, when you're HBO and you've kind of been used to having the playground to just between yourself and Netflix, you're sitting on an IP that critics liked, that audiences liked, apparently a lot of people watched it. I, I just got to imagine, Rob, that at some point they're going to realize, of course we have to do another season. Even if it's not with Lindelof, we got to do another season. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, we'll have to wait and see. Question you know, is, guys. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think one of the byproducts of all of this that I really am excited about, at least that the streaming wars are going to bring us, is Watchmen was hugely ambitious from a storytelling standpoint, from an intellectual standpoint. And what's happening is the bar is being raised really high for all of these shows, whether we're getting Watchmen or something like The Expanse, whether we're getting The Morning Show. I can't wait for the next season of Ozark, HBO's new Stephen King adaptation, The Outsider. This is all really excellent television and the bar is just being pushed ever higher and it's nice to see that consumers are embracing this kind of a-list tiffany storytelling that we're getting and what a great time to be a a, a fan of, of of television or streaming whatever you want to call it all right guys the question is what do you think about this do you think it's a mistake that lindelof stepping away do you admire what he's doing do you think hbo should move ahead with the second season of Watchmen? i want to know what you guys think jump down to the comment section below and let me know your thoughts all right with that down, let's move on to another off the top. And this one focuses around sort of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now, of course, for those of you who've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it follows Rick Dalton, who played an actor named Jake Cahill, who played, sorry, who played, Leonardo DiCaprio played an actor named Rick Dalton, who played a character on a TV show uh, called Bounty Law, and a character on that uh, show called Jake Cahill, I think is the name of the character. Of course, so there was that fictional show, Bounty Law, that was part of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Well, it looks like they're going to make a special television event, a five-episode television event of Bounty Law, and Quentin Tarantino himself is writing and directing it. He's he's come out. He's kind of made it official. This is what Tarantino said. He said, as far as the Bounty Law show uh, goes, I do want uh, to do that, but it will take me a year and a half. I ended up writing five half hour episodes, so I'll do them and I will direct them. I got it from an introduction for from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but I don't really consider it part of that movie, even though it kind of is. This is not about Rick Dalton playing Jake Cahill. It's about Jake Cahill. Where all this came from was I ended up watching a bunch of Wanted, Dead or Alive and The Rifleman and Tales of Wells Fargo. These half hour shows to get in the mindset of Bounty Law, the kind of show Rick was on. I liked them before, but I really got into them. The concept of telling a dramatic story in half an hour. You watch and think, wow, there's a hell of a lot of storytelling going on in 22 minutes. And I thought, I wonder if I can do that. Now, it should be pointed out right now that as of this moment, there's no official word that Leonardo DiCaprio will be a part of this, but I can't imagine that he wouldn't be. I mean, Tarantino is not even, and I can't believe that Tarantino would even be entertaining doing this idea unless he already had Leo DiCaprio 
committing to being a part of it. So I got to imagine that he will, but as of right now, no official word. Listen, I am not the biggest fan in the world of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I liked it. I thought, I, I think it's a drastically overrated film. I don't think it's one of Quentin Tarantino's best, and I'm a huge Tarantino fan. That being said, I love this idea. This idea of taking that fictional show from within a quasi-fictional movie and then doing its own series of it, I think is fantastic because some of the best parts, Rob, of this movie was when they were doing you know, all the different Rick shows that Rick was doing. Some of it was Bounty Law. Some of it was when Rick is playing a villain on another show. I loved that stuff. I think this is a tremendously creative, wonderful idea. And I want to see it done. I think this is great. Rob, you hear about this. What are you thinking about it right now? Well, what I'm, I'm curious about is, like, are we going to get, say, a 10-episode run of a Bounty Law show that Quentin Tarantino would have written if he was making Westerns and, on TV in the 60s? Or are we going to get a Bounty Law show that's about the making of Bounty Law and Hollywood of that time? Or a combination of both? It's, it sounds like it's just literally going to be five episodes of Bounty Law. Yeah, I mean, if that, can you imagine? I, I mean, if they're going to have to do it in the style of that that era, you know, shoot it in black and white in four by three. I mean, they can, who, and if DiCaprio comes back and does it, imagine the guest stars they'll get. Imagine all the actors Tarantino will be able to pull in to play the bad guys. I oh my mean, gosh! You could get you could get Meryl Streep as a madam of a brothel, you know, or something like I that. I hadn't even thought about that. That's a uh, huge, I mean, huge it, thing. It could be unbelievable, <laughs> and, and who wouldn't want to do it? You're right. I, I think just that lineup would be insane. I, I think every single episode, he'd have probably like Academy Award winners lining up to be the villain of the week or something. That's such a great observation that I didn't even think of. So the guys, <laughs> the question here is. What do you think about this? Do you think maybe it's trying to milk the whole Once Upon a Time in Hollywood thing a little bit too much? Or do you feel like we do, that this is a really fantastic idea? Or maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. One more thing off the top here, guys, before we get into our main topics. And that is this. You know, one of the biggest in-debt companies in the world is actually Netflix. <laughs> they are like, I believe, 15 billion dollars in debt uh, is Netflix. Keep that in mind as we look at this news story that just came out today. Variety is reporting that Netflix is actually increasing its spending this year for 2020 on content from around $15 billion, which is also the same amount of money that they're in debt, to $17 billion that Netflix is going to be paying in content this year alone. They just went further into debt at 15 billion and they've increased their spending by 2 billion up to 17 billion dollars. Rob, this is a fascinating situation. And I, part of the reason why I find it so fascinating is because there's two different ways you can look at it. One of the ways is this is this seems desperate. I mean, Netflix has all this competition now and they're just drowning in debt and all this kind of stuff. And then they're spending more money once they're going more into debt. That doesn't seem wise and all that kind of stuff. And I think there's a point to be made there. I do. I, I think there's a valid point to be made there. That being said, though, Netflix seems to really understand the situation that they're in. We talked a minute ago about how HBO is finding themselves in very unfamiliar waters right now. It's They're used to having just them and Netflix in the sandbox. Netflix is in the same place. But they're realizing right now that they no longer have the streaming world to themselves and the sharks are circling. The sharks of... I still get mad at myself whenever I got to say the word peacock. The, the, the sharks of Disney+, Plus, the sharks of Apple TV+, Plus, and others that are coming, by the way. And they understand that. And they understand what they cannot do is become an outfit that is playing catch-up. They can't play catch-up. They are in the lead. They want to stay in the lead. And they have decided to adopt a strategy of really put the pedal to the floor and get original content out there, maintain that dominance that we have in this space right now, and don't give these other places a chance to catch up and start siphoning off our viewer base, which they're going to do to some degree, 
but how badly it's going to happen is yet to be seen. So Rob, on the one hand, I totally get somebody looking at a situation like this and going, this is pretty unwise of Netflix. You just went more into debt. You're increasing your spending. That doesn't seem smart. But to me, Rob, in, in business, you got to spend money to make money, go big or go home, no risk, no reward, whatever cliche you want to use. It seems that Netflix is realizing we need to not slow down and be conservative at this point. This is not the time to play conservative. It's time to be aggressive. And that's what they're doing and they're going for it. And I got to say, it is a risk and this could blow up in their faces. It could. But I think it's the right risk to take. That's how I feel about it at any rate. Rob, you're looking at this big spend by Netflix. You think this is a smart move or kind of a silly move on their part? Well, (laughs) I think it's if I was running Netflix, I would be terrified. $17 $17 billion, first of all, people don't quite understand, I don't think, that like studios are not sitting on a vault full of billions of dollars that they can just draw upon whenever they want to make movies. They're borrowing money. Their operating costs are enormous. Netflix also has massive infrastructure of their own. They've got they've got a huge overhead. They've got they're building they're building a new facility in Hollywood. So let's just assume you're making a billion dollars from your subscriber base a month. That's only twelve million dollars total that they're taking in before they've spent any money. Then they have the debt they already have that they have to pay back that they are getting interest on every day. They have all of their overhead, all of their employees, then all of the programming that they still have to pay for that's already in production. And now they're promising another $17 billion. Where is all of that money coming from? Where, where is, uh, aside from increasing debt, I don't get where they're, where, they're, where they're drawing upon, where are they getting the resources to make all of this and keep Netflix afloat? I mean, if they're just going further and further into debt, one day those chickens are going to come home to roost, y'all, and it ain't going to be pretty. Uh, I I think it's cool that they're doing it. And by the way, I'd like to get some of that fat Netflix cheddar on my own for some projects. John, why aren't we on Netflix? I mean, come on. Wouldn't you like to get even like one one thousandth of a penny of what they're spending? Oh, it would be great. It would be uh, great. I, but it's like I, that old South Park joke. Netflix, we you're greenlit. I mean... It's uh, we'll see. You know, it's funny because just last year they were talking about how they were going to scale back on the riskier projects, but it sounds like they're just going to dump more into what they would consider big, big, big projects. And whether that's the right move or not, we're going to have to wait and see. Do Question think, here is, guys, what? Go ahead. Do you think that uh, there's one alternative I can see for them, and that is to add ads to their platform? Do you think they will? No, I, I think they know if they, unless they say drop everybody's subscription prices in half if they suddenly introduced ads to their platform i believe you're gonna you'll see a revolt i just don't believe that's something you can do i think you could launch netflix with ad supporting and then later take it away you can't launch with a subscription base and then later introduce ads i yeah i don't think they can do it because i think they'll lose a lot more money than they would make up i think they'd lose more money in subscribers than the money they would gain from the ads Uh, but I mean, I don't know, maybe there's a creative way to do it. The question here is guys, what do you think about this? Do you think this is a really tick? Is Netflix just a ticking time bomb at this point, or is this the right aggressive move for them to do? I want to know what you guys think. Jump down in the comment section below and leave us your thoughts. All right. With that down and out of the way, let's now move on to our main topics today. And how do we select our main topics? Well, you see, it's really rather simple. You guys come up with our main topics by going anytime, 24-7, over to www.thejohncampiashow.com slash contact. Once you get there, you're going to see a form, fill it out with your topic or question, hit submit, and then maybe, just maybe, you might see your topic or question featured here on The John Campia Show as a main topic. With that down, let's move on to main topic number one. And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by TJ Vance, who writes... I read in The Hollywood Reporter that Apple is finally releasing The Banker on March 20th. Given the sexual misconduct allegations that halted the movie's release, what do you think about Apple's decision to finally release The Banker? Do you still want to see it? All right. Thanks a lot for sending in that question, man. And yeah, The Banker was a, is, a, is a project 
that I thought looked really good. I thought the trailer looked great. And then, of course, there was this controversy that came out about one of the descendant family members who was a producer on the movie and the other members of the family saying he was incredibly, he was a very, he was uh, abusive and a predator and all that kind of stuff. Apple threw the brakes on the project saying, I don't know if we, you know, feeling like they don't know if they can release this thing or not. Well, apparently now Apple has made the decision to release it. This is the official statement that came out from Apple. We created Apple TV Plus as a home for stories that matter and believe the banker inspired by the brave actions of Bernard Garrett Sr. and Joe Morris, two African-American businessmen who brought about positive social change, is one of those stories. We wanted to take the time to understand the situation at hand, and after reviewing the information available to us, including documentation of the filmmaker's research, we've decided to make this important and enlightening film available to viewers. So as of right now, they are moving forward and they're going to be releasing uh, this film. Rob, is that like, in light of, you know, the movie was done, we hear these allegations in light of all of that, is it the right move of Apple to release this film at this point? I absolutely think so. I mean, in the, first of all, if your descendant does something despicable, does that mean that retroactively the good deeds that you did decades ago are suddenly washed away? Are those something that you shouldn't share? And I, and I think that, you know, what are we going to do? Or how far back do you go? Do you go back decades? Do you go back centuries? This is an important story. It's a story that needs to be told. People need to be reminded of it today. You know, I, I read a recent article about how horribly Harry Belafonte was treated when he moved into the Los Angeles Hancock Park network or network ne uh, neighborhood. I didn't know anything about it. And I'm like, who doesn't love Harry Belafonte? And, and I thought, well, what a really interesting story to tell. Now, would you not tell it because people that might still be living or the descendants of people that were mean to him still live in Hancock Park today? No, this was a story that should be told. It's a story that will be told. And I'm glad it was told and that we're going to get it. Uh, we're going to get to see it and learn from it. And I'm glad Apple TV, after an investigation, they looked into it, they stuck to their guns and they put it out. Because this idea of, of it's not just canceling people anymore, canceling history, it's frightening. And I'm glad that Apple took a stand. It looks to be, as soon as I saw the trailer for this movie, John, I'm like, this is a wonderful film. And to find out, it looks like a wonderful film, I haven't seen it, but it, to find out that, okay, his descendant uh, did bad things, does that mean that all the work that people did on this story that took place decades ago should be canceled? Uh, that's not right. It's not right. Now, of course, there, it, it, it does have the added little twist in there. That there wasn't just a descendant. It was a descendant who is a producer on this movie. And so it's kind of a it's a it's a double edged sword. It's a producer of this project uh, actually did that. But that notwithstanding, Rob, I got to say that I agree with you. Look, the first thing that should be pointed out here is what Apple is saying here is in no way a validation of this guy. They're not no. at all saying that, oh, this guy didn't do anything wrong. We love this guy, blah, blah. They're not saying that at all. This is no, this is in no way, shape, or form any kind of vindication for the allegations that the family has made against this guy. Not at all. But I agree with you 100% about the decision to release. First of all, I should say this. I believe Apple slamming the brakes on to evaluate the situation properly 100%. was absolutely the right thing for them to do. Yep. At the end of the day, did some mudsucker was was some mudsucking idiot involved with this film on an important level? Yeah, probably was. But there were thousands of other people involved with this film. There are thousands of other creators and artists and actors and, and professionals who worked on this film and stand to benefit from this film, including Apple TV that invested millions of dollars into it. And at the end of the day, do we say the actions of the one person, even if it's a significant person, should undo the work of thousands. And I've always been uncomfortable with that because if we do, then what we're saying is if we go back into the history of the Ford Motor Company and we find out that somebody working on the assembly line that made your car is somebody who beats up baby kittens at night, 
are you going to get rid of your car? Should they no longer make those cars? Should they not sell those cars? Well, I, I mean, and, and I granted that's hyperbole. I admit that is hyperbole, but it's the basic principle of it. So I, I'm 100% in agreement with you, Rob. I think it was the right move for Apple to hit pause on this, take a look at it, really digest it all, understand the scenario, and at the end of the day say, one guy being a jackhole isn't going to stop the work of hundreds and hundreds of other good people and creators and artists who put this thing together. And so I, I agree with it. I like the fact that they're putting up. But listen, I'm also not going to pretend like this is an easy issue. It's not no. an e easy issue. I'm sure there's many different points of view to look at it. My question for you guys is this. How do you look at this? I, I'm personally very much looking forward to this film. I agree with Rob. I think this is an important story to tell. Or maybe do you feel like, listen, the nature of what this idiot did and who he is maybe should play a bigger role in a decision to release or not. Maybe that's how you feel. I want to know what you guys think. Jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right. With that down, let's move on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today gets sent into us by Derek uh, Priano, who writes, Hey, John. So Doolittle, which is, of course, the new Robert Downey Jr. film, is sitting at a solid 16% on Rotten Tomatoes. And one headline was, Well, it's better than Cats. Ouch. The movie cost, <laughs> the movie cost around $175 million to make. Will it even get close to breaking even. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, Derek. And you know, I, I, you, I've got to go look that up now. I got to go see what is Doolittle uh, sitting at right now in Rotten Tomatoes. And as of right now, uh, the new movie Doolittle is sitting at, oh, it's gone up. It's gone up. It's now sitting at 19%. It's sitting at 19%. Are there going to be lots of headlines that say don't little or did or, little or yeah no. yeah they did little or they the variety headline is going to be for the box office on monday it did little it should have done more um <laughs> listen i everybody knows i'm a fan of robert Downey jr this film is horrible <laughs> it is absolutely horrible now i say that with a little bit of a heavy heart because you know aaron cummings went with me to go see this and we talked after the movie. And one of the things that I said to her when we came out, I said, that, that movie sucked. We both agreed it was terrible. But I said, it sucks that it sucked because you can tell watching this movie that, man, seriously, every frame of this movie screams best of intentions. They were trying to make, and I, and I tip my hat to them for this, they were trying to make a whimsical, magical family adventure kind of film and you you could tell to the down to the very dna of this film they were really trying hard to deliver to the audience a magical experience at the, at the movies and a fun time at the movies and you could tell that was their goal you could tell that's what they were going for but i can be aiming for the basket from half court it doesn't mean the ball's going to go in the net and with Doolittle, i'm sorry the ball did not go in the net this this was a dare i say almost painful movie to watch it was almost painful to watch um and it, this is just an example i think rob we've talked about this before an example i think of you know a script can look great on the page and then once you actually start shooting the damn thing and you start editing it together and that it's not till then that you realize that yeah the concept seemed great but it doesn't really work um and i it's hard to quantify what there's good about it. I, I didn't like Robert Downey Jr. in it. I mean, every line of his dialogue was talked in basically whisper. And one of the things that Aaron said to me when we walked out and I immediately yelled, yes, was like, is it just me or was every line of dialogue that Robert Downey Jr. had in this movie totally ADR'd? And I'm like, yeah, it totally was. And you could totally tell. Um, I mean, that, that just on its own became distracting. And I'm sorry, but for, th for 2020 standards, Whereas if we jump back in time six years ago, we would have looked at this movie from a visual effects point of view and gone, wow, not today. It, it, there was there was some real lapses in, in the visual effects to me. But again, the basic story of it, like if you sat down and read a one page synopsis of it, story seems solid. You got a solid underlying you know theme there. But it's just the execution to me, Rob. The, the execution just to me did not work and... You know, it it cannot, 
I cannot help but wonder, Rob, looking at this, if we're not going to see the same thing happen that we saw after Robert Downey Jr. did the judge and that tanked. You know, Robert Downey Jr., remember when the judge was coming out, it looked like Robert Downey Jr. was done with the MCU. It looked like he was done. His contract was up. It was very public. It didn't look like they were going to sign. He did the judge. Suddenly it tanked. And all of a sudden, everybody was like, and then all of a sudden, a new deal has been reached between Marvel Studios and Robert Downey Jr. And I'm telling you what, I'm not going to be surprised at all. I don't mean to sound skeptical, but I am not going to be surprised at all if within the next few weeks we don't start hearing rumors and buzzing of Robert Downey Jr. and Kevin Feige having lunch at the Four Seasons or something and working out a new deal for him to come back because this thing's a stinker. But you know what? Here's the thing about whether or not it'll break even. It looks fun. I think you're going to get a lot of family out there opening weekend. I don't think this movie breaks even, but I don't think it's going to be a Titanic level, like a sinker. I don't think it's going to flop totally because I think it, it's it got Robert Downey Jr. It's animated animals, all that kind of stuff. So I believe there's going to be a family audience for this regardless. So I, I don't think it's going to break even, but I don't think it's going to be a monstrous flop either. Rob, you're hearing all the feedback from this thing. How do you think from everything just you're just observing? How do you think Doolittle's going to perform? Well, there's, you know, I've read a lot of articles about the troubled production of this movie. And what I find really interesting is the director, Stephen Gagan, is a renowned, a screenwriter of some renown. He wrote Syriana, which I really liked. He wrote uh, Soderbergh's adaptation of Traffic. He wrote The Rules of Engagement. But he's never, ever worked on a film that has massive amounts of visual effects. And to me, this is probably, at least from what I've read and, and judging by his past credits, this is somebody who I think was way out of his depth in terms of dealing with, first of all, when you're dealing with half the cast of CGI animals or, or this kind of these kinds of visual effects, look, George Lucas had enough of a problem dealing with actors when he made The Phantom Menace. So when you're dealing with an actor like Robert Downey Jr., who uh, I, I just think the wrong director was put in charge of this project. And that this coming from somebody who who really liked Gagan's work as a writer. And then as a director, I mean, he directed Abandon and Syriana and some TV movies and Gold. But none of these were effects. None of these were effects driven movies. And the fact that he got this film to direct is uh, I understand he wrote the screenplay, but man, you know, it you, you really need to get the right director with the right material in order to make a movie like this work. Because if you're not, uh, you, you don't know your effects or you don't know animation. I mean, I worked on Chronicles of Narnia with uh, uh, as a documentarian and director Andrew Adamson. He made the Shrek movies. So he was aware of how to use animation and create creatures and all that. So he had an understanding. But Stephen Gagan has none of that, none of that background. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how this works out. Question is, guys, have any of you had the opportunity to go out and see Doolittle? How did you feel about it? Maybe the good intentions of the film really won you over, and maybe you saw the positives more than the negatives than I did. I went in hoping for a really good time. Unfortunately, I, I really I, I don't think it's going to end up being the worst film of 2020 or anything like that. It's not that bad, but it's not <laughs> to me. It really wasn't good. But what do you guys think about this whole thing? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, let's move on to our third main topic today. And our third main topic today gets submitted to us by Sejis Ramirez, who writes, Hello, John and team. There's been a lot of talk recently about who the next Bond could be, and even if the character could be a woman moving forward. Just wondering if you saw the producer say she just can't ever see Bond being female. What do you guys think about her comments. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, Sahis. And uh, the only reason I knew how to pronounce that name is because I went to school with a guy named Sahis. Sahis Garcia. If you're watching Sahis, how you doing, Barthor? Um, anyway, yes, uh, Barbara Bacoli, who, bar by the way, I always just called her name Barbara Bacoli. Is it Barbara Broccoli? Broccoli. It yep. is pronounced Broccoli. The family thought... actually had something to do with Broccoli itself. I actually always thought it was Broccoli, but there you go. Broccoli it is. Anyway, Barbara Broccoli uh, weighed in on this whole issue about, you know, because all of us are wondering, we're speculating what happens with James Bond after this next movie and Daniel Craig steps away. 
Could it be a Tom Hiddleston? Could it be an Idris Elba? Could it even be a woman? Well, Barbara weighed in on this herself, and this is what she had to say about it. She said, he, James Bond, can be of any color, but he is male. I believe we should be creating new characters for women, strong female characters. I'm not particularly interested in taking a male character and having a woman play it. I think women are far more interesting than that. And that is a comment from Barbara uh, Broccoli. And listen, I got to say, Rob, I am one of these people that I am totally okay with any uh, person, any, uh, I mean, you're obviously a right-fitting actor, but of a person of any race or whatever, I don't think James Bond has to be white. I don't think there's anything inherent in the DNA of the character of James Bond that says the character's got to be white. There's nothing about the character that suggests that. So I'm totally fine with that. I'm even open, I'm open to the idea of them making James Bond a female character if they wanted to. I've said that before. I'm I'm open to it. But I think the better thing to do, I've always thought, as what she just said herself, would be to actually create new characters for women themselves to play rather than like saying like a hand me down. Oh, but here now you can play Bond or something like that. So I think it's very interesting that Barbara came out and made these comments. Rob, as the resident big James Bond fan here, what did you make of these comments? Well, first of all, I think she's absolutely right. I mean, the idea is James Bond is a literary character based on the work of Ian Fleming. He, he was written uh, in a certain time to be a certain way by an author that created this character. And while we have seen all different kinds of permutations of characters that have had gender swapping and all that, I don't necessarily object to that. But also, this character was conceived to be a certain way. It's it's He's the work of of an individual, of an artist, of an author. Uh, the same guy who wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, by the way. <laughs> and and it, it's it's like, when do we stop? Is it disrespectful to the original? I mean, I know he's long dead, but why don't we allow James Bond to exist the way he was conceived? He's, he's part of history. That said, you know, Barbara Broccoli's put her money where her mouth is. She's made a movie called The Rhythm Section that stars Blake Lively, it's got Bond-esque. I mean, it's supposed to come out at the end of the month and nobody's talking about it. So she actually made a movie with a female protagonist based on another series of books. So she's not somebody who's just paying lip service. I'm sure somebody's going to get mad about her comments. But she actually went out and spent millions of dollars making a movie series about, a, well, hopefully it'll be a series, about a female, well, a woman who becomes an operative starring Blake Lively. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who get angry. But I agree I, I think this idea of gender swapping or race swapping does a disservice to people who weren't the race that the character began as or the gender because that just says that what we can't create new characters that are that they have their their own race and their own gender baked into them. I mean, it's such a weird thing that we have this impulse that we want to change that somehow changing the gender, changing the ethnic backgrounds of a character is somehow that's somehow helpful. I would say, no, we want to see new characters. We want to see characters that, that I want to see a black James Bond. I want to see Idris Elba as a secret agent because that would be badass. I love Idris Elba. He classes up the joint. I've loved him since he was Stringer Bell in The Wire. I love Idris Elba. So why not give him something new to do that he plays to his strengths, that he can make a role that 50 years from now, people will talk about Idris Elba in the role the same way that they talk about Sean Connery playing James Bond. Whatever that new secret agent is that Idris Elba made so indelible he exists half a century later. Isn't that what we should be doing? I, I don't know, man. I, I got to disagree with you on the whole thing about the race, about the particularly about the race thing. You know, my position in this has always been, unless, like, let's say Black Panther. Okay, it is inherent to the character itself that you have yeah. to have a black actor playing it. For sure, you do. But there are so many characters, when you really look at the DNA of the character, their race has nothing to do with who and what the character is. Because where do we draw the line? Like if we say, okay, here's this character and really nothing about the character suggests that really the character should be white or black. If we right. draw a line there, then aren't we going to say, well, wait a minute. In the original book, 
This character was five foot nine and a half. This actor is five foot ten and a half. Are we going to say in the book the, the you know the guy's eyes were blue? Well, that actor can't be it because his eyes are brown. Like I, to me, unless there's By the way, something they said that in, about Daniel Craig about his. I, eye I, they color. did, and that's and I'm so glad that they shut them up because Daniel Craig turned out to be my all time favorite James Bond. But I, I just think that unless there's something inherent in the character itself that really requires them to truly be that character it's required that that character be asian or caucasian or black or however else or, or middle east or whatever unless there's something inherently in the dna of the character that requires the character to be that i don't care if a character is five foot eleven instead of five foot ten i don't care if the character's skin tone is darker or lighter i don't care about any of that stuff as long as it doesn't buck up against an important element about who that character is supposed to be. Well, and if it doesn't, then I'm all for it personally. Look, I think what you just said, 100%. And one of those, the perfect example of that, one of my favorite novellas of all time was Stephen King's, is Stephen King's Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. And the mm. main character, along with Andy Dufresne, is Red. And in the story, Red is a white dude. And in the movie, he's Morgan Freeman. Now, even as a lover of the the story, and I used to read it every year at Christmas before the movie had come out, um, did it bother me that Morgan Freeman was black? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I can't even imagine the movie. I can't even read the story anymore without seeing Morgan Freeman as that character. And it's great because in the movie, Andy, Andy Dufresne says, uh, why do they call you Red? And, and Morgan Freeman says, maybe it's because I'm Irish. You know, and they dealt with... <laughs> They, they, yeah. they dealt with the whole <laughs> issue of race right then and there. And I'm like, I don't care. I think you're right. But, you know, the character of James Bond now has been around for over 50 years, since 1962 yeah. on the screen. And in the case of Bond in particular, I think it's a little, it'd be a little odd. Not that I would mind. I mean, if Idris Elba was 36 years old, make him the new Bond. You know, mm. I wouldn't have a problem with that. But what you're doing with, like, with a character that's been around for so long. But then again, I guess... Ultimately, it really doesn't matter, but it just seems to me like when you're going to do it now, I mean, maybe you could make it different, but he is a British officer of the Navy and he did come out of the Cold War. And I mean, there's just a lot about the Bond character that it, it's sort of baked in. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't really have a, a problem with anybody black or white. And I think I always use Shawshank example. Shawshank Redemption is the, the primary example. It's a great example. But then it's like, why are you doing it now? Because it's fashionable or does it serve the story? I always tell people, for me, it's always about the character and the story. It ends, it begins and ends there. And if you've got a reason, or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe if you don't say anything about his color or her color or gender or whatever, and just go go ahead and make it matter of fact, it'll work that way. I mean, they've swapped one of the main characters. Uh, they've done a gender swap in Dune, uh, Denis Villeneuve's upcoming Dune. One of the characters, Dr. Kynes, was was a man in the story. Now it's a woman. And I don't have a problem with that. Right. You but know? see, there's, there's, a, there's a difference, though, I think. There's a difference because I think you could have, theoretically, I'm not saying this is what they should do. I'm just saying, theoretically, you could have Vidor Selva playing James Bond. And I think he could embody everything that james bond is oh, yeah in a baddest way but you know how i was saying like hey as long as it's not a core part of the dna i'm sorry while i'm not against the idea if they wanted to try something really radically different and have a female james bond i'm not against that per se but at the dna level of james bond is unavoidably inexcusably and you know, beyond any debate is a male character. The, the, the core DNA essence of who and what James Bond is, is at its core, in its DNA, a male character. To change James Bond from white to black actually doesn't really change anything about the character. To change James Bond from a man to a woman, I think that fundamentally changes who and what the character is. A, a neat example, though, to go against my own argument, though, Rob, is... If you look at something like Battlestar Galactica with Starbuck, right. I mean, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm about to contradict my own statement because when they switched to Katie Sackhoff as Starbuck, I, a lot of people went, wait a minute, and including me a little bit, like Starbuck's not a, I mean, Starbuck's a dude. 
And her Starbuck was fantastic. So that kind of contradicts my own argument. But there's there's exceptions to every rule. I just think James Bond is in his DNA a guy. I think when you well, look at all of his traits, he's in, inexcusably male. So I don't know, that's me. But I think you just pointed something out by bringing up Starbuck, which is a great example. The the creators of David Icke and, and Ron Moore, when they decided to reimagine Galactica, they had a vision for the character. And being all about authorship myself, if you have that kind of a vision, if you really have a reason and you think you can do something new, I thought the character Katie Sackhoff Starbuck was far better written and far more interesting than Dirk Benedict Starbuck from the original Galactica. And that was, of course, she had four years to develop that character. I mean, she was one of, I think, of the, if you go back and you look at television of the aughts, she's one of the great characters that oh, was I on agree. TV. Totally and, agree. And I, I I would never want to prevent a, a, a writer or a producer if they've got a vision for a character and they can bring us something new and unique and they have a reason for doing it, by all means, go for it. I have no problem with that. What I hate is when people just do these things willy-nilly because it's fashionable at the time. That's what all I right. don't like. Question here is, guys, you hear the producer of James Bond saying, nah, uh, we, we just can't see James Bond as a female character. Do you applaud that? Does uh, Do you not like that? How do you guys feel about it? It's a touchy subject with a lot of people. I understand this. A lot of people that I'm sure agree with me, a lot of people that agree with Rob, a lot of people that probably disagree with both of us. But what do you guys think? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, let's move on to main topic number four. And our fourth main topic today gets submitted to us by David King, who writes, Hey, John, so I've just seen that the Mindhunter cast, this is completely blowing my mind. I've just seen that the Mindhunter cast have been released from their contracts as David Fincher is too busy at the moment to make any more. What do you think this means for the future of the show? Mindhunter is, in my opinion, one of the best shows on Netflix, and I'm praying that it doesn't get canceled. Now, for those of you out there who are reading David's David's words and going, wait, wait, time out, what? No. Didn't they just yes. say didn't they just say they're going to spend 17 billion dollars on content? It is absolutely. Mindhunter is absolutely one of the best things that Netflix has ever had. And the second season was strong. And now they're saying it may not happen. Saying, what is this all about? This is where this comes from. This comes from a report in The Hollywood Reporter. Sorry, that was the wrong. That's a future story. This one came to us from our friends at Slash Film. Netflix has put Mindhunter on indefinite hold. That's never a, that's never a good sign. On indefinite hold while executive producer David Fincher focuses on juggling his other projects. But while we hope, while hope remains that Mindhunter could come back, the involvement of current cast is now in question. As Netflix has let the options of cast members Jonathan Groff, Holt McElhaney, uh, I always mispronounce his name, and Anya Torv uh, expire last month. That's from Slash Film. They have not renewed their contracts. They are now free agents to go and sign up and do whatever they want, which means they may or may not be available, even if Netflix a little bit later on wants to come back and do another one. To me, Rob, this is concerning. And the main reason why, to me, it's really concerning is on several levels. But one, it's from a planning and logistics point of view. Why do you not have something in place prepared, understanding that, hey, Finch is a busy guy. He may go at some point. He may do this. Why did you not have a contingency plan, especially after season one? After season one was so so successful and so beloved and everybody liked it so much and all that kind of stuff, how did you not have a contingency plan in place just in case David's not available? You got all the actors there. They're signed. They've got options. You've got an option on their contracts. So you can extend it just by snapping your fingers. They're ready to go. People love this show. You're spending $17, $17, $17 dollars on original content. How on earth did you not have a plan B in place for something like this. It's concerning to me. I cannot, uh, if you had told me, Rob, a week ago that, you know, they're not going to do Mindhunter season three, I simply wouldn't have believed you. Me neither. I simply would not have believed you. And listen, while the report does say, like, hope still exists, the fact that these these actors are now no longer under contract, all it's going to take, and you know somebody's going to snap these people up. Some other series is going to snap these actors up. 
And suddenly now, sorry, we're not available to come back for Mindhunter season three. We went on to other things because you let us go. I, I, I am... I am confused. I am befuddled. I have, like, I just cannot imagine what rationale goes into saying, yeah, we can just let this one sl uh, go by the wayside. And I'll tell you what else it does for me, Rob. This is the other thing it does. It makes me hesitant to get too attached to any Netflix series. Like, I get it. Maybe three and done. This was two. And it was on a roll. And it makes me hesitant as a fan to ever allow myself to invest myself emotionally into getting attached to a TV series that's on Netflix because at any given moment, regardless of how successful it is, regardless of how much critical acclaim it's getting, regardless of how successful it is, at any given moment, these guys could just pull the plug on it for whatever inexplicable, you know, contrived reason they come up with. I get it. David is a key, key piece of this puzzle. I get it. But you know who he is, and you know how in demand he is, and you know what kind of vision he has. So why didn't you have a plan B in place? Why didn't you have him grooming somebody to be ready to take over the show when he was going to go step away and work on other things? Why was this kind of stuff not in place? Because if you're Netflix, you got to start thinking longer term with beloved content and properties with everybody else coming out. And I get it and I applaud them for spending $17 billion and all that kind of stuff. But this to me, it, it just it just reeks of incompetence. It reeks. And I'm not saying obviously Netflix is filled with very, very smart people. I'm just saying this isolated incident, though, to me reeks of incompetence. And I just can't believe it. And maybe you can make an argument, Rob. That I'm just saying this because I'm a butthurt fan because I like the show. And you wouldn't be wrong. There's there's truth to that. Part of me <laughs> is just reacting because I'm a butthurt fan and I love this show so much. And I'm just kind of butthurt that they're not bringing it back. I admit that 100 percent. But that doesn't mean what I'm saying isn't true. Just because I'm butthurt and salty and mad and whining like a little baby doesn't mean my whining isn't filled with truth. And it's just confusing to me, Rob. You you saw these reports. You read about this. Your reaction and how do you explain it? Well, first of all, I just want to say we did get two seasons of incredible television. I mean, absolutely. Mindhunter, what a, what a fantastic show. What an uh, 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 Jonathan Groff and and uh, the, the rest of the cast they're so great, and that was beautifully made. I'm just happy that we I did get two seasons of that. You know, like in in England, the BBC will do shows like Fleabag. It looks like two seasons and gone. Um, I I wish. I mean, they did kind of leave this show on a cliffhanger, sort of, and I I really just like you. I will lament. I will. I will sing songs of the joys of watching <laughs> Mind Hunter, but I, I, I do wish. I do wish that, like the whole point of of television, the whole production model used to be that if a show is successful, it really starts to get into profit when it gets into its fourth, fifth, sixth seasons, when strip syndication will allow it to be syndicated all over the world, and with these streaming shows, that doesn't that doesn't really apply. So there's really no incentive for for Netflix to do like they they're hoping that no oh, Mindhunter's gone so we'll move over to watch V Wars you know or whatever their new show is. And I I wish I wish that wasn't the case because part of the reason that Netflix is successful is because they're creating a fan base for their programming. And you know, if they keep jerking everybody around, I I'm surprised they bought Designated Survivor from NBC after two seasons, they gave it a third season and then, oh, canceled it. And I'm like, well, but you brought it from NBC. You, 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 you would still joy into my heart. And then you took it away. And I don't like that, John. <laughs> I don't like that Mindhunter is one of the best shows on TV right now or streaming or anywhere. And now it's just unceremoniously gone. I understand David Fincher is making Mank, but... But he'll be done with it. Some, what's he going to do? Make another seasons of 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 robots and 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 the show he's doing with Tim Miller, which I like. Apparently they are. Apparently they are. Uh, he is going to make that, another one of those. Yeah. I mean, then, then why can't he oversee Mindhunter and let other people make it? I'm sad, John. Yeah, and I'm again, to, to me, it's just a matter of there have been shows that I've always thought I'll get caught caught up on, but then I found out it got canceled after two seasons, three seasons. I thought, oh well, then what's the point? Especially if it gets. If the pl plug gets pulled like halfway through a story, you know what I mean? And I, I, I just don't 
get this. I just don't get this. So somebody smarter than me, in which there are a lot, is going to have to explain this to me. But anyway, guys, how are you feeling about this? Mindhunter? Maybe you didn't even watch a show. Maybe you watched it and you didn't think it was that great. Maybe you're like me and you thought it was one of the best things on TV. How are you feeling about this news right now? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay. With that down, let's move on to our fifth and final main topic today. And our fifth and final main topic today gets submitted to us by Oscar Ching, who writes, Hey, John, huge fan of the show since 2012. Thank you so much, Oscar. We appreciate that, man. So the, the Hollywood Reporter reported yesterday that Taika Waititi has been approached by Lucasfilm to develop new Star Wars, a new Star Wars film. I absolutely love this news. I love the season finale of The Mandalorian, which was directed by Watiti, and I believe a Star Wars movie directed by him could be amazing. All right, thanks a lot for saying that in, man. And listen, once people heard that Taika Waititi was even going to be involved in The Mandalorian, a lot of people started speculating about maybe the notion of him doing a Star Wars film. Then once people saw his uh, Jojo Rabbit movie, which I think a lot of people didn't know what to make of it before it came out. And then it, to me, it is, by the way, the best film of the year. To me, Jojo Rabbit is the best film of the year. And what Taika Waititi did in that showed me that he was capable of things I never even thought he was capable of. But once that happened, then a lot of people started going, wow, maybe Taika Waititi for a Star Wars movie. And then once they saw like the final episode of Mandalorian, then people were really like, I think we should see him doing this. Well, The Hollywood Reporter just threw a lot of uh, gas on that fire because The Hollywood Reporter came out and wrote the following. They said this is an exclusive report of theirs uh, that they're saying, and they said the following. Taika Waititi, the filmmaker behind the Oscar-nominated Jojo Rabbit and Thor Ragnarok, has been approached to develop a Star Wars movie, sources tell The Hollywood Reporter. It is unclear uh, where things stand in those talks. It is also unclear whether the project is separate from the one being developed by Kevin Feige, with whom he has closely worked on Ragnarok or separate Star Wars uh, or a separate Star Wars project. So that report is coming us from the Hollywood Reporter. Rob, I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing about this that isn't glorious to me. <laughs> there's nothing about this that isn't glorious to me. Because I'll tell you what, here's the thing. Taika Waititi, up until just recently, was known as the funny guy. You look at what we do in the shadows, which is, guys, listen, if you <laughs> have not watched what we do in the shadows, I'm not talking about the TV series, which apparently is also very good, but yeah. the movie, I don't know what the hell you're waiting for. you got to watch this. And yes, Thor Ragnarok took a much more humorous turn with, with the movie and all that kind of stuff. A lot of deep, heavy stuff happens in that movie, though, as well. Uh, wilder people, all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you right now, without spoiling anything for those of you who haven't seen Jojo Rabbit, all I got to say is the shoe scene. The shoe scene. Taika Waititi crafted, created, and directed one of the most emotionally impactful moments in all of cinema from last year. The shoe scene is something you're going to be, I believe for the next 10 years, you can be in a conversation with a film fan and just say the shoe scene and every, and they're going to know what you're talking about. He crafted a movie in Jojo Rabbit that did have fun and levity, but also heaviness and seriousness and emotional attachments and depth and meaning. And it was all beautiful crafted into this incredible feature film that I, again, I believe is the best film of the year. I believe that Taika Waititi is not just a great director, Rob, who could do a Star Wars film and probably do pretty well. I believe Taika Waititi is in his DNA a perfect fit for something like Star Wars. When you look at his films and you see the various elements of adventure and action and fun and humor with the ability to incorporate into all of that emotional elements, deep, deeper characters, uh, getting us empathizing with our characters and stuff like that, which he showed in spades he's able to do with Jojo Rabbit. To me, Taika Waititi is the archetype of what a near-perfect director for a Star Wars movie would be. Now, I'm not getting into this whole discussion, Rob, about, you know, I don't like talking about X director for X role, but if it's being reported that they've approached him, I'm going to tell you right now, I am all the hell for it. Yeah. I am all the hell for it. And I just don't see how 
what he has exhibited and the skill set and the tools he's got in his belt, I don't see anybody saying, seeing how that's not a perfect match for something like a Star Wars movie. When you can get the heavy with the levity, when you can get the action with the drama, when you can get the fun with the heartbreak, when you get a director who can bring you all of that, and clearly he gets the feel of the Star Wars universe, man, because when you watch that episode of his as the Mandalorian, it was it was absolutely Star Wars, you know, as much as the Mandalorian was. I think this would be fantastic. Now, I don't think obviously this is not in the bag. This is not locked. But if Lucasfilm has already approached him and he's got already a very great relationship with Disney because he gave them Thor Ragnarok. He also gave them now that they've taken over Fox, he's given them a best picture nominee. Uh, Because it is Fox, right? Jojo Rabbit is Fox, which is now owned by Disney. So he's given them a Best Picture nomination. And they could have buried this movie. Oh, and they totally could. uh, There were people speculating that they might bury the movie, and they didn't. It's, I think this is, would be, would be, if it works out, I think it would be tremendous. And I don't see, knowing how big of a Star Wars fan that Taika Waititi is, I don't see him passing up on this. And I think this would be a pick that almost all Star Wars fans would rally behind. Because there's been a lot of division, Rob, in the Star Wars fan universe for a couple of years now. I believe this could be a pick that not everybody, because no, no, there's no name you could mention that everybody would rally behind. But I believe this would be a name that I think most of the Star Wars fan base would rally behind. Anyway, maybe I'm being too pie in the sky optimistic about this, Rob. But you see this. What what do you think about them going to Taika Waititi? Do you think this is actually going to work out? And is it a good idea? Well, I think you nailed it on the head with your analysis. I mean, I, I think Taika Waititi is one of the most exciting filmmakers working today. Again, I always talk about authorship. The man, The man has a vision and he brings it. He brings it to the fore so well. I mean, what we do in the shadows is one of the great, I mean, I put it up there with Shaun of the Dead as one of the great horror comedies of all time. It's such, it's such a wonderful movie and he stars in it, you know, and what he did with Ragnarok was great. His, his other uh, New Zealand film was uh, terrific. Will the people was great. Um, And that had a lot of heart in it. And in a way, I mean, the guy who made that movie making a star Wars film, I, I know that there's probably a lot of people out there that might say that, you know, maybe Taika Waititi's humor could be a little much, but you know, <laughs> even what he did with IG-11, <laughs> the the voice acting that he brought, I think Taika Waititi would respect Star Wars. He's not going to go in there and like turn it into something it's not. I suspect that he has a great love of Star Wars the way we all do. I'm sure he grew up with it. And I would love to see his take on the Star Wars universe because he would be able to bring emotion and pathos and great characters. And then he would still give us, I think, the rousing entertainment and, yes, humor that is inherent in the Star Wars franchise. I think he's a perfect director like you do as well for this franchise. This is really exciting news. And, you know, you don't make him part of another saga. You allow Taika Waititi to extend and create more, something new for the Star Wars universe we haven't seen. Because whatever he cooks up, I'm sure it's going to be pretty amazing. Uh, I agree. And so, guys, I wanted to make that the subject of today's question of the day and that is our question of the day today is how are you feeling about this do you like this idea here's how we put it to you guys i asked with the question of the day with lucasfilm courting taika watiti to direct the next star wars film how would you feel about him taking it overwhelmingly 71.1 percent saying you love the idea uh 24.8 percent of you saying it could be okay and only five percent Only 5% are saying no, they're completely against this idea, which honestly, even though I said I I feel like this is a pick that could rally, that I think most Star Wars fans could rally behind, I still expected that, no, I hate the idea number to be a little bit higher, but it's only at 5.2%. So that's where it's sitting right now. We put this up just before we start the show. 3,400 of you guys have cast your votes there already. I'm going to leave this up on my Twitter, the poll open for the next uh, 24 hours or so. So go on over to my Twitter, which is simply at John Campia, and cast your vote there. And in the meantime, guys, how do you, who are watching the show live right now, feel about that? Jump down into the comments section below. Do you like the idea of Taika Waititi? Do you not? How are you feeling about it? Let us know your thoughts down below. All right, guys. 
With all of that down and out of the way, we're now going to move on to the next part of the show, which is your live questions. If you want to get a live question on the show, then all you do is you look in the top line of the description of this video, and you're going to see the tip link. It's uh, streamelements.com slash movieblogtv, all one word. Uh, go ahead and click on that, and you can submit your question there, and your question will be answered on today's show or maybe in a companion video a little bit later on. But that's how you send in the questions for these shows. But before we get to that, Rob and I, as we do every day, we're going to take a quick four minute break here, rest the vocal cords, stretch our legs, go refill our drinks a little bit, give you a chance to run to the bathroom if you like. So come on back here, guys. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. I'm sure we're going to talk more about some of these issues here, including the Taika Waititi things. So don't go anywhere. We will be right back.
And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, holding tight. And this is interesting. Uh, this came up just as we were on uh, on break here. But apparently this news has come out. It may not be that big of a deal. Uh, it, it is symbolic in many ways. But this is news that just came out. Disney apparently is officially killing the 20th Century Fox name. And instead will use the name 20th Century Studios. So, And they're going to get rid of Searchlight and instead, or Fox Searchlight, and they're going to call it Searchlight Pictures. So on the one hand, it sounds huge, but maybe it's not all that huge. Because remember, Fox is a company, still a company that exists, uh, separate from 20th Century Fox. So them keeping the 20th Century name and take, taking the name Fox out of it probably isn't that big of a deal, but it is a, a momentous change. Rob, you're seeing this. What are you thinking about this? I, You know, John, the 20th Century Fox logo, because of Star Wars, because of Alien, because of so many movies, 20th Century, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, I've loved, I've dreamt of making a movie that had the Fox logo in front of it and hearing that fanfare. Mm -hmm. One of the great fanfares of all time the 20th century fox logo has been my favorite studio logo and now it's gone and i it's not that it's unexpected but i really thought that they would keep the 20th century fox brand alive if only because they could release other movies underneath it but i guess no why would they i guess that was naive and 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 like me hope springs eternal john but they've just they've murdered my favorite studio logo and murdered my favorite fanfare. And I, I think I think it's it Did might they very though? well. Did they I, murder the fanfare? I, I don't see why. I mean, the, it's not like it's not like the fanfare includes a choir going Fox. Like, I mean, so I, 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 I know. But but it's so I mean, that it is it was that is literally called the Fox fanfare. And if they're going to if they're going to get rid of it. I mean, they're getting rid of the name Fox and it's 20th bet, Century Studios. I'll bet you a dollar they keep the fanfare. I mean, Cause, maybe. Because why not? Because I don't think they're looking. Because why Why keep the 20th Century name? Why wouldn't they wipe that all out too? It just seems to me like they're just specifically to avoid confusion. Because remember, there is a company called Fox that still exists. I know. It, it seems like they're just. I wouldn't doubt it, Rob. I, I don't know this. I wouldn't doubt it if this logo that we see up here simply gets the bottom line changed. I think I wouldn't doubt it at all if we still get a very similar looking logo with 20th Century Studio uh, down at the bottom instead of, pardon me, Fox down at the bottom and that we still get the same fanfare. Because I think if they weren't worried about keeping some of the tradition of it, then why not just get rid of the name entirely? Why, why keep 20th Century? So I, I, I don't know this. I might be dead wrong, but I'm willing to bet you $1 that they actually do keep the fanfare, and I think the structure of the logo will probably stay the same. But you don't agree? You think they're going to sweep that away too? I think they're going to sweep it away too because, you know, in this day and age, branding is everything. And and they're going to – if anything, they'll create something new. And, and even 20th Century Studios – why keep why what is that name all about? Like 20th Century Studios, we're not in the 20th century anymore. You know, I always thought Fox would have created a 21st century Fox logo and they would have <laughs> unveiled it because that would have been badass. I mean, they'd only have to change one number, but they didn't do that. And I I just look, change is always good. That's what nature is all about change. Life is all about change. I understand that. But as a film fan, as somebody like when I hear that 20th Century Fox, that logo, especially with the Cinemascope extension, the da na 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 da na 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 da na 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 When I hear that, I get all ghibli, John. It's a, it's almost a Pavlovian response to hearing that music. It just puts a smile inside my whole being. And if I never get to hear it again on a new movie, I'm going to be one sad cinemaphile. I, I got a feeling they're going to keep it. I think they're going to keep it. They're just getting ready to the fight. But I don't know. Maybe they will sweep it away. We'll have to wait and find out. All right, guys, listen. We're not going to move on to the live questions that you guys have been sending in for the last little bit. We're going to start by getting caught up on a few that were behind, and we'll get into the ones that you've sent in today. So let's not waste any more time and jump right into it. We're going to start things off with uh, Payne, a.k.a. Batman writes, 
Um, your rant on the diversity in the Oscars preach. I've been saying this for years. Keep up the real talk. And, and th- thanks for saying that. And listen, I know it's a touchy subject. I know people have different opinions about it. And I respect that. It's just that my personal opinion where I'm at right now is just I don't believe that diversity in the results is the job of the Oscars. I believe that's the job of Hollywood to make sure we get a more diverse pool of film and talent making things so that when the Academy looks at all the movies and talent that were made that year, there's a lot more to pick from. I think that's Hollywood's job. I think Oscar's job is exclusively to evaluate in their own heads what was best. That's it. Nothing else should be taken into consideration. And, but I know there's a lot of different people who have different opinions on that, and that's why we have dialogue about it. Anyway, Jason O'Connor writes, John, who's your money on, Conor McGregor or Cowboy? Super, I am super excited for this fight. I think it's going to be a fabulous fight. I'm going to be screaming my lungs out for Donald Cowboy Cerrone, but I do believe... <laughs> I do believe that Conor McGregor will win the fight, although I'll be screaming my head off for Cowboy. Darth Sidious writes, uh, Hi, John, Chris, and Aaron. Well, unfortunately, Chris and Aaron are not here. Uh, I enjoyed the Nerdwire video because, of course, uh, Chris Carr works full-time over at Nerdwire. She makes some great videos over there. Uh, You did on the Dragon Prince, and as we're on the anime talk, how about an anime recommendation? Well, unfortunately, she's not here. And I am not the person to do an anime recommendation, obviously. <laughs> uh, but Rob, I mean, do, would you have an anime that you could pull off the top of your head? I mean, uh, obviously, the one I always go to is Space Battleship Yamato, also known as Star Blazers. I love that thing. But that, I mean, my repertoire is actually very small. Do you have one you would recommend to people? Well, the one I always recommend to people, my favorite anime of all time is Legends of the Galactic Heroes, not the new version that came out last year. But the the OVA series that ran for about ten years, it is this. It's not only is it one of the greatest animated shows I've ever seen. It's one of the greatest science fiction shows that's ever been put on television. And the the first hundred and ten episodes, they're amazing. And Sentai Filmworks, which is a domestic distributor of animation, put out an amazing Blu-ray box set of it last year for like eight hundred bucks. I know it's insane, but uh, you know, it's my favorite anime of, of all time. And, you know, I have my I have right back here, John, uh, somewhere. Here it is. Last year. Well, actually, this year, Space Battleship, the remake. 2202, uh, there it the is. Comet, the Comet Empire series. I've got the full series now. Man, is this incredible. Just so you know, love it so much. But you're right. And this new this if you haven't seen if you've never seen Star Blazers, a.k.a. Space Battleship Yamato, uh, both twenty one ninety nine and uh, twenty oh uh, twenty two are incredible. And they're doing a new season. And I cannot wait. And in terms of space adventure, space opera, it doesn't get any better. And the remake is incredible. All right. Next up, we go to another one from Darth Sears who writes uh, to the second part of his thing is um, uh, so have any of you ever heard of an anime called the miraculous tales of ladybug and chat noir i gotta say i never have I, I've, I've never heard of that you haven't either rob so sorry no. about that all right darth Sidious also writes in the first two seasons are on netflix but it isn't an original so season two is split into two parts of 13 episodes each as there are 26 episodes in season two something i will keep my eye open for thank you for, and i'm sure again one of the best things about making these recommendations even if it's not one that i'm particularly interested in checking out the great thing is that sometimes i do check them out but the better thing is that there are thousands of other people watching and a lot of them go and check it out and often write in and thanking me for the recommendations that you guys make. So thanks for sending that in, Darth Sidious. All right, Roberto Gonzalez writes, uh, will we ever see Lex Luthor in his battle suit in a live action movie? Okay. Um, when, uh, as I always say, Roberto, whenever you use the word, the words ever or could, the answer is almost always yes. Will we ever? Probably whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, I'll be honest with you. I have zero interest in Lex Luthor in the, in the armor suit. Come on. Um, uh, no, no, seriously, because to me, <laughs> like that, that's so, that is so against what makes Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor to me. I know they did in the comics and the cartoons. I get it. But to me, that's not what Lex Luthor is. Lex Luthor, as John Cryer said in the uh, crisis on infinite earth crossover, this line epitomizes Lex Luthor in the battle of, Brain between brawn, brain always wins. And i that's wh- how I like my Lex Luthor. Not that he, no, I have a suit that can, I can also do fisty cups with Sa- Superman. I mean, I, I get it, but I've never liked that. So I hope not, but they very well could do it. Rob, what do you think? 
I want a hot toy of that figure, dude. Come on, man. He can fight. <laughs> I mean, he can fight it, armored Batman from Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. It looks no, good. Uh, I'm not going to deny it looks good. I, yes. Uh, look, I am, am a. I've always been a fan of that. I mean, they made a great figure for the Superpowers collection back in the '80s. I, I agree with you though. I think in the modern age of superhero films, uh. There isn't a whole lot of verisimilitude to be found in that power suit. <laughs> um, <laughs> as much as as much as I would enjoy seeing it, it, it kind of shatters uh, what they've accomplished over the last well, even since since X Men came out in two thousand. I think I think most people might laugh <laughs> at All seeing right. Luther. In this. I agree. All right, Jacob Hirsch writes. Uh, John, can you, Ann and Corey do one final arrow after show for the series finale? You know what? I haven't thought about that, but that might not be a bad idea. Cause of course me, Ann and Corey used to do arrow after show religiously, especially once when the show was just starting, maybe that's something we should do. I I'm not going to say yes, but I'll at least talk to Ann about that. That might not be a bad idea. All right. Javier Belmer writes. About the Hollywood diversity debate, uh, what you and Rob said is quite applicable to all industries. It's important to support diversity, but you can't force it overnight. Uh, equal opportunity, yes, but not equality of outcome by nature of fair competition. Uh, I mean, look, I also believe there is, like, sometimes equal opportunity, though, means you need to start, you need to actively be proactive and plant seeds. You know, Rob raised a great point the other day about you know, um, whether it's a Lu uh, Wang or whether it's um, a Deborah Chow or whether it's a, a Bong Joon-ho or whether it's uh, whoever, whatever directors, whatever, you have to be willing in an industry to take some steps to say, you know what, if we're going to have change, we can't just sit back and just wait for it to happen. There are some proactive things I think you need to do. And that includes giving some directors an opportunity that can then, as Rob so eloquently put the other day, become inspirations for generations coming to create movement. Change doesn't happen just by sitting stagnant. It's at some point needs some proactive stuff. But that doesn't change my opinion that the Oscars their job is still just to award whatever they think is best. That's it, period, end of sentence, end of everything. Um, and it shouldn't It shouldn't never uh, be otherwise. But yes, it's a process, but it's still a process that takes active steps rather than just being stagnant. And I, I think there's a lot of truth in that, Javier. All right, uh, Suthius writes, uh, Rise of Resistance this weekend, uh, going are you? We're planning on it, of course, our friend Cody Miller, uh, of course, Olympic gold medalist who's getting ready for the next Olympics and is Minor Rob's co-host on Best Movie, Worst Movie, which we're also, we are starting to record the new season of Best Movie, Worst Movie uh, this weekend. We are going to try to get out to Disneyland to go to Rise of Resistance. The problem is I'm hearing the wait, like even once you get there and check in, it's like an eight or nine hour wait to get on it. So we may or may not go this weekend, but you know I'm going to go soon. Uh, Phil Corvelli writes, I want to see Mark Strong play Darth uh, Malgus in the new Star Wars films. I want it. Well, I mean, listen, Mark Strong is a great actor. I love seeing him pop up in anything. Again, me with the X actor and X role. It all depends on how they do him, so there's no point in saying that, but I do love me some Mark Strong. Rob, if they were to announce tomorrow that Mark Strong was going to be Darth Malgus, would you be down for that? Yeah, and by the way, I have an awesome shot sideshow Darth Malgus figure. No. So I, I, yes, I do. And by the way, I would love that. I love Mark Strong. He would be rad as Darth Malgus. I'm in. Count me in. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, Fan Jexture. Going back to something Rob said the other day. Her hot toy does ride my bat pod as well. Phrasing. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say something when Rob said that the other day. I decided not to say anything, but I'm glad that you did, Fan Jexture. I'm glad well, that you did. I meant that literally, John. She really I know. does literally ride my six scale bat pod. All right. I mean, I... <laughs> phrasing, <That's> phrasing. <laughs> but I knew what you meant. All right. Uh, Jesse writes, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths is basically cats. Characters just randomly showing up and introducing themselves and leaving never to be seen again. I, I mean, that is ultimately my... I, again, my ultimate thing with this crisis thing is that it was lazy as fuck. It was lazy as fuck. It was... Hey, let's get Tom Welling. Okay, let's create something really cool for him to do and make his appearance important. Nah, let's just have him show up. They, it was lazy. We got Tom Ellis as Lucifer. Okay, let's figure out how his appearance will influence it. Nah, let's just just let's have him show up and put him on screen for a minute. 
Oh, uh, Ezra Miller. Oh my God. Let's let's make some sort of suggestion about this and how they let. Nah, just just have them pop in and say hi and then have them disappear. It was lazy. The whole thing was lazy, Rob. This this that's. I'm not saying that this particular crossover didn't have its moments or its merits. It did, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it looks like they put absolutely no effort in trying to make this story. <laughs> when you look at things like Crisis on if, uh, uh, Crisis on Earth X and other crossovers they've done, which are, of course, silly and tongue-in-cheek and stuff like that, but you could tell they really put effort into the story. This one was just, hey, everybody loves Crisis on Infinite Earths, and wouldn't it be cool if we had Tom Welling? And wouldn't it be cool if Ezra Miller showed up? Wouldn't it be cool if we did this? And, we, but, and no thought went into it. It was just fucking lazy. It was lazy from start to finish, and it ended with a total thud to me. Total thud. Some great fan service moments, but that's all. Anybody can do fan service. Sorry, you don't have to be talented to be able to do fan service. Anybody, everybody watching the show could come up with 50 things that would be great fan service that they could have dropped in there. Anybody can do that. And and so I th- I'm getting angrier about it the more I think about it. You know, the more I think about this crisis on, Inf- on Infinite Earth, <laughs> the matter I get. I don't know. How would you respond to that, Rob? Well, look, I, I think part of, part of, I know from back in the day when they started dreaming this up, they went after all of these actors. And I think they 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 didn't know it was it, they really swung for the fences getting all these cameos. And I know it seems like a lot of fan service, but it took a lot of work to get all these people to be in the show. But yes, I do think I loved seeing people show up the way they showed up. I just wish when I when you had them, it would have been more interesting to me to bring in concepts that that went back to the 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 crisis itself like again i keep saying well what happens to hell where lucifer's from during the crisis on infinite earths is does hell exist in the multiverse or is there only one hell and if so is it going to be destroyed were there hells on other earths and i i i would like to have known just from a storytelling and genre standpoint how did all of these other characters what did it all mean? That's why I did love the Ezra Miller appearance because you did learn something about him that the, that he didn't call himself the Flash, that his Earth was ending, he didn't know what was up, and I really I enjoyed that interplay because there was at least something meaningful to it. Although in the long run, not a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> All right next up we got uh jason uh espinoza writes hey john and the rest of the film loving community regal is offering a best picture film festival pass for only 35 dollars see seven of the best picture nominated films as many times as you like from january 31st through uh february 9th marriage story and irishman are excluded yeah i guess because there's probably a, a netflix uh things there well that's too bad yeah amc has that's for a cool many- idea It is a cool idea. AMC for many years, Rob, has actually run what they call the Best Picture Showcase. It's a big thing they do every year where over the course of two days, you can go and watch all the pictures nominated for Best Picture. So it's it's a great thing if that's what you're really into. And it gives everybody an opportunity that, hey, as I'm sure a lot of people, most average film fans have not seen every single movie nominated for Best Picture. It gives you a great opportunity to do that. I love that Regal's doing that as well. It's too bad they couldn't figure out a way to get uh, the Irishman and Marriage Story in there because those are two of the two of the front runners. I mean, I'm not saying they're the, the de facto favorites, but those are two of the front runners. It's too bad that they couldn't be a part of that. So that's a shame. All right. Uh, next up, Fifty Shades of Geek writes. Uh, if you ever go back to the Schmodown, your entrance music should be the song that plays at the beginning of each show and during the break, followed by someone saying, and his name is John Campia. A little bit of uh, John Cena-ism in there. Uh, yeah, I've, I've always thought about if I ever did go back to the Schmodown, which I probably will not, uh, you might see me color commentating sometime. I have um, a great team you can join. Uh, here's the problem, Rob. And by the way, I, I saw that you drafted well. Uh, here's here's the problem. It's 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 putting a man amongst boys, and there's just there's no challenge. This what's the point? There would be no personal satisfaction in it. It would just be a bully entering the playground to beat up all these little pretenders. Uh, there's just there's just no point in it. Um, but in all seriousness, I no in all seriousness, I just don't have the time. I mean, that's just the bottom line. But I I might sometime pop in there and be on the desk with Christian. Like Christian knows, uh, he and I loved being on the desk together for Schmodown. So I'll, I'll, I really might do that at, at some it. point. I just, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing the desk. It was really great. My favorite moment ever is that that uh, four way knockout that Mark and Draco had. 
Uh, do you remember that? That, that was, was like the best moment I think ever in Schmodown history. It was amazing. And it should also be pointed out that you and I, Rob, are, were an undefeated. We, we were, were an undefeated, undefeated team, team in, in Schmodown competition. Just wanted to point that out as well. Yep. Uh, all right. Next up, Willow writes, uh, we just had 10 centimeters of snow in Vancouver and the public buses have broken down. Oh, that sucks. Uh, I'm seriously freaking out right now. Does my Canadian citizenship get revoked if I hate snow? <laughs> I actually, no, it doesn't. I love snow. I was I spent some time yesterday, Robert, talking about how snow, winter is my favorite time of year, bar none. Uh, and I really miss, I, I, I appreciate the weather in California I very much do but I miss the winter so much you probably got some good winters up there in uh in Seattle up there in the Pacific Northwest did you not we did I mean it was it, you know we get snow on the ground like once or twice but uh I loved it and of course we had some great hills to sled on nice and uh you know there was a lot of like we would sled down these really big hills and try and jump on each other's sleds because they were fast you know, radio flyer kind of sleds, and it was fun. I, I mean, there was nothing better than a good snow day. Oh, I agree, man. I agree. And I'm so a big much. skier too, so. Uh, all right, let's move on here. Django writes one of two. John, I agree that trailers need to be shortened down, but if you advertise the time that the actual movie starts, then people will start showing up late around when the movie is starting or later than that, and it'll cause a big distraction to the movie. Uh, I work at a theater. Uh, and people are always running late, and this option will only increase that. I imagine watching 1917 and a group of four come in talking, uh, walking in front of you to get to their seat and opening their candy chips. It would create more distractions. I completely disagree. I have worked. Uh, I've worked many years at a movie theater <laughs> because for for years we had our our uh, studio at the AMC at the busiest movie theater. Sorry, the third busiest movie theater in all of the United States of America. Uh, was the AMC Burbank 16. And uh, people show up. The only reason people would do that right now is because at first people are expecting there to be, or a bunch of people are expecting there to be 15, 20, 30 minutes of trailers. But if people knew, if we change that system and people knew when the movie started, oh, they're going to be in their seats when the movie starts. You're always going to get stragglers. But guess what? You're going to get stragglers no matter what. And no matter how, you could start the movie two hours after the advertised start time, you're still going to get stragglers. It's going to happen. It's going to be a part of it for sure. What I like, there's a movie theater uh, here, Rob, in, in Hollywood that I know you're very familiar with, the Arclight Cinema in Hollywood. Ooh, I love it. And they have a rule there. If you don't, like, you can come into the theater and go to the restaurant in the theater and stuff like that, but if you don't go through the part where you got to actually give your ticket to the ticket ta taker by the advertised start time of the movie, they don't let you in. I'm nope. not kidding. They don't let you in. If your advertise, if your movie advertised start time is 7.15, and by the way, Arclight only plays two or three trailers, which I think is great. If you don't walk in and you don't get your ticket ripped by 7.15, they just don't let you in, which I think is great. But I honestly think once you change the system and people adjust and understand the system, I really don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. Rob, what do you think? Uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal either, but I, I do think a lot of people, I mean, I'm surprised this issue has become a big issue, but I understand movie, movie houses, they make money from playing advertising and, and, and I don't know about trailers, but I get what they have to do, but it's all about the, the presentation, you know, is important. And I think like the arc light, like you said, they play three trailers and that's good. And it, it accentuates the experience. People obviously don't like this. They don't like lots of trailers or lots of ads. And it diminishes the experience of going to the movies. And you don't want that to happen. So I think theaters are going to start to listen to this and maybe change up their, their practices. I hope. Uh, yeah, here's hoping. All right, next up uh, comes us from Daniel H. who writes, Seems like the gentleman is not so subtly copying the first Kingsman movie with their marketing. Uh, same font for the title, same kind of graphics and backdrops for uh, the title cards. And of course, just the freaking tone of the movie looks exactly the same. Okay, here's the problem, Daniel H. Then you can make the argument that the that Kingsman was just blatantly ripping off uh, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch, which were, of course, his movies before he was doing The Gentleman. So saying that, this is Rob what it reminds me of. 
Uh, there used to be, there was this um, online comic strip that I used to read all the time, and it was called Player versus Player, or PvP. I don't know if it's still around, but God, I used to love that online comic strip. For those of you who used to read it, you know what I'm talking about. But there's this guy, uh, there's this one character who's reading Lord of the Rings for the first time, right? <laughs> He's like, man! This Lord of the Rings, this JR guy, he all he did was rip off Dungeons and Dragons with elves and rangers and stuff like that. And of course, it was around first. Um, so hearing somebody complaining that that one of his movies, whether you're looking at Lockstock, Snatch, the King Arthur movie that he did, whatever, is copying Kingsman when no, no, no. His movies have been this style long before Kingsman was ever around. So I, I don't know. How would you respond to that, Rob? Uh, well, yeah. And also Matthew Vaughn used to produce. I mean, he, he used to work with Guy Ritchie. That's right. So, yeah. So, it's so they have some like, similarities. Yeah. And it, it's and and maybe they, they that was intentional. Who who knows? But yes, I, I, I think, look, movie advertising has always sort of cannibalized itself. It's nothing new. And um, in, in a way, I, I kind of I understand. I get it. I respect it. If there's, hey, it's it, it ain't show friends. It's show business. And whoever brings in whatever gets people to get their butts in the seats, that's the way you got to go. All right. Next up, Daniel H writes, a Joker will and probably should win Best Picture. I disagree. I, I don't think I'm 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 all for Joker being nominated for Best Picture. I'm all for it. I love this movie. I do not think it deserves to win Best Picture, but uh, I would put about four or five movies ahead of it personally. But it is awesome, and I think it's going to be 1917. Uh, I think 1917 is probably going. To... Anyway, uh, I didn't care for it, but it's tied with Parasite for most important movie of the year in my opinion because of the timeless uh, the time timeliness of its social commentary on class divide i just think parasite did it better it's my number one and i certainly have parasite above by the way parasite is my number two favorite movie of the year uh is parasite but it, it i mean whenever you use terms like most important film of the year that that's a that all depends on what's your criteria What's your criteria for determining what is important and what is not? Yeah. Because the, like the, the criteria that you bring to it or the criteria that I bring to it may not be the criteria that the person next to me brings to it. You know what I mean? But listen, you, you'd be kind of naive if you didn't think Joker has a shot. I don't think it will, and I don't think it should. But I think you'd, you'd have to be a little bit naive not to acknowledge that Joker definitely does have a shot at taking home uh, this award. Rob, how would you how address that? How crazy would that be, by the way? That'd be crazy. No, but I think it do absolutely does have a shot. I mean, obviously, it's a zeitgeist movie. You know, it really got under people's skin. People were talking about it. It was definitely one of the movie events of 2019. The performance, uh, the direction, the cinematography. I mean, it is a slick A-list production all the way. And it resonated. I, I, I think I think Joker is the kind of movie that, you know, people will watch it in 30 or 40 years and it will have meaning. They will understand. I mean, the movie, to me, a great picture, a great best picture talks about universal concepts. And the Joker touches on a lot of things about urban life today and the alienation many people feel, our healthcare industry, the media. I mean, it deals with those big topics that are a favorite of Oscar voters. But boy, if a comic book movie won best picture, man, all bets are off. Wow, that would be amazing. All right, uh, next up, and this will be the last one that we're going to let Robert get out of here because he's got things he's got to do today. Uh, the next one up here comes to us from Jordan, who writes, uh, one of two, the witches on IMDb page has a huge makeup effects crew. Love me some practical effects. Uh, the story has a monstrous looking witch masked uh, as a beautiful woman. I'm sure Zemeckis will camp it up with the gross like um, in Death Becomes Her. A film like this could have easily been a stream, a streaming film. The fact that it's coming to theaters in October, Zemeckis directing with Del Toro, Quran producing, tells me we're in for something cool. Might be a popcorn movie, but what's wrong with that? Am I right? Well, listen, Rob, we've actually been talking a lot lately about um, about this movie, which is which, of course, Zemeckis and Hathaway, stuff like that. And there there really are so and whether you're looking at who's producing it, who's directing, it, who's starring it. The, and the basic subject matter of it too, and what yeah. you could do with something like that. And we've been saying for a while, and I totally agree with you, dude. I, I totally agree with you, um, uh, Jordan, that this is something that looks like it could be really, really fun. 
I mean, really, really fun uh, on yeah. so many different levels. And listen, it's to the point that I've set up that I'm going to be really disappointed if it's not because my expectation levels is maybe getting unfairly high. But I'm very, very stoked to see this. Rob, how are you feeling about it going into it? I, look, I can't wait. I love the original source material. I like the original movie. But the the, the talent that's lining up for this film is extraordinary. I think we're going to get something wildly entertaining and so much fun. And I can't wait. I love witches. I, I think this is going to be great. Anyway, Rob, for now, that does it for you for all the time that you have here today. But listen... In the meantime, where can people find you and all of your uh, verisimilitude goodness online? Well, you can find me, of course, on Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or come over to my YouTube channel, The Burnett Work, and find my show, Rob Observations, the show about something. All right, dude. And uh, you and I are getting together a little bit later today. So I will talk to you a little bit later. Yes, sir. You have a good one. All right. All right, man. See you later. Let's move on a bunch of things to talk about and get to here so let's keep right on rolling with your questions uh the next one up, uh, up comes to us from anonymous viewer who writes what's your thought about the Doolittle movie uh i'm reading pretty bad reviews for it so far i'm gonna go see it anyways but i want to hear your take uh to be prepared just in case i did not like the film again it is made with all of the best intentions uh, and you could just tell they wanted to give the audience something magical and fun and to me it just failed on an awful lot of levels it's it is in my estimation and all film is subjective so you may love it and that's great if you do but for me i walked out pretty disappointed i thought it was i actually thought it was uh uh thought it was quite bad to be uh to be honest with you um okay uh i think i missed one from 50 shades okay um well, we're not going to go into all that kind of stuff. Uh, not going to go into that either. Um, okay, Ronnie uh, Falcon Jr. writes, John, this question I need answered badly. Should Morbius be successful, and I hope it is, would that jumpstart Jared Leto's redemption to reprise his Joker, considering he's contractually obligated to be in more movies? I hope it does. Nope. Nope. Uh, it, it, it. Look, the studio isn't going to look at Oh, the actor did something hot. The studio's looking at people didn't respond to our character. That's how they're going to look at it. And I really do think that Morbius could go on to win Best Picture at next year Academy Awards. And here's hoping it, it's that good. I hope it's that good. But even if it did, even if it goes on to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards next year and Jared Leto wins Best Actor at the Academy Awards next year and all that kind of best possible scenario uh, becomes a part of it. It's not going to change Warner Brothers feelings that the audience didn't respond to this character. The way we wrote and did this character, they didn't respond to it. And it doesn't matter how popular the actor is now. We don't think it's going to go back. So I honestly don't think so. And I agree with you, Ronnie. That is disappointing to me because I am one of the few people that actually really did quite like Jared Leto's Joker. I, I, it was such a different take on the character, but still at its core Joker. And I love the toxic, awful, you know, codependent, terrible relationship that he and Harley Quinn had. I, there's something about it that was compelling to watch. Um, so I, I'm with you. I'm disappointed, but I don't think, uh, I, I don't think regardless of how successful Morbius is, I don't think it's going to make any sort of a difference to what they do with uh, Joker in the DCEU. All right. Seth Lunsford writes, Hey, John, for fun, let's try and, and uh, achieve video game adaptation glory. Theatrical release, HBO series, and scrap one. The options are uh, God of War, Halo, and Gears of War. Which one would you pick? And Godspeed video game adaptations. Well, God of War to me is the most cinematic. God of War is, is the most potentially cinematic. So to me, that is a theatrical release. Halo is being a series halo is something that could be a series so i mean i'm not saying by the way listen i am clearly not saying that i don't think gears of war can be a successful adaptation in one form or another not at all but i i do believe god of war is by far the most cinematic out of this bunch i believe halo is the one that lends itself maybe to being a series better uh so that unfortunately the way you've set up the rules seth 
means one's got to be left out in the cold. In this case, it's going to be Gears of War, but that is not me making any sort of a negative comment on it at so, uh, whatsoever. All right, an anonymous viewer writes, the Alien and Predator universe has been one of my favorite my entire life, but I can't help but think that these franchises have wasted the most potential. What do you think, or are we beating a dead horse like the Terminator franchise? Thanks. Oh, we're beating a dead horse at this point. I, I, I really do feel like, and I can take my headphones off now, I really do feel like it's beating a dead horse at this point. They've, round, uh, they've run these franchises into the ground. But I do believe that Disney still may have some plans for them moving forward. I mean, they said at uh, CinemaCon all the way back in April that they were going to have plans moving forward. They were going to have plans. And whether or not they actually do bring those to fruition or not, we'll have to wait and see. But whatever they do, they're going to have to go in a new direction. That much is clear. They're going to have to, if they do anything with the, either the aliens or the predators at this point, they got to go in a new direction. What the direction will be, we're going to have to wait and find out. All right. Film Boss writes, I have seen 6,000 movies, just did a top 350 list, and only four of those films were directed by women, uh, Wendy and Lucy 2008, Lost in Translation 2003, Howard Stern's Private Parts, and Away From Her. Really? You, I mean, there's a particular best picture winner that won, that, you know, was directed by a woman who also won best director. Okay, you don't have that on your top 350? All right. I can't help but feel a little bit embarrassed by this. Hey, listen, you can't be embarrassed by what your favorites are. You just pick your favorites and if whoever's there. That's kind of like the Academy Awards for me. It's to me, the, op the, the onus is on Hollywood to make sure more women get opportunities than they've been given in past years. Look, I've said this before. I will say it again. But there is no arguing around it. Patty Jenkins who made a movie in Monster with Charlize Theron that won an Academy Award and got lots of Oscar buzz, was considered one of the best films of the year. And she didn't have another directing gig until Wonder Woman. Had a man, and I'm sorry, there's no way around this, had a man directed Monster that won their lead performer, best act actress, and got other Oscar buzz and was considered truly one of the one of the best films of the year. Not the best film of the year, but considered one of the best films of the year. That guy would have had offers coming out of his ass. But because it was a woman, she had sat on the bench for a long time. Now, there were a couple of opportunities that she had from here and there, but really it was not what it would have been had she been a man. And so to me... It's not up to you, film boss, to just say that movies directed by women are in your top list. No, no. Your job as an individual film fan is just to say what your favorite is. It's up to Hollywood to make sure more people have more opportunities so you have a better crop to select from. That's their job, not yours. So don't be embarrassed by that. All right. Jared Oberfeld writes, anime recommendation. Uh, weathering with you. A boy falls in love with a girl who can control the weather and people pay them to bring them sunshine. That sounds a Adorable. I had to wait 40 minutes for it to start because AMC didn't properly load it into the projector. Woo. Is that like a film projector? Or they didn't, like it was the digital projection, they didn't have the right file loaded. Well, that's first of all, that's unfortunate. But you know what, Jared? Here's the thing. I say this all the time. When you consider that every day in the United States alone, there's probably 20 to 30,000 in theater movie presentations every single day. Every single day. To me, it's not surprising to hear that you had a 40-minute wait because of a technical problem. It's surprising to me that it doesn't happen more often. Considering like 20,000 or more times every single day in the United States of America, a movie theater does a presentation. You would just think that there would be more problems than what we actually get. You just think it would happen more times than not. So that's unfortunate. But thank you, Jared, for that recommendation. That actually sounds really adorable. Thanks for sharing that. All right, Murray Reich writes... <laughs> <laughs> Murray writes, hashtag release the Babu Freak cut. Release the Babu Freak cut with all that 20 minutes of deleted Babu Freak uh, thing. That's what we want to see. All right, Jaron Me writes, hi from Indonesia. Thank you for writing from Indonesia. Uh, first time tip, been following since a long time. Thank you so much for that. Uh, John, you said that you're a sucker for heist movies. I am. Um, there's a Thailand film, Bad Genius, about high school students making money by cheating tests. It's my favorite Asian film. You'll love it. Okay, you've you've hooked me. Give me a second here. Uh, what's it called again? Bad uh, Genius. 
Uh, IMDb. Let me look this up. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, the actual name for it is uh, Chalard Games Gong. I, I guess that's the original thing in it. Ooh, the poster looks awesome. It's got a little bit of a, a Breakfast Club kind of vibe to the poster. All right. Okay. Hold on. So let me add this to my list. All right. Thank you for sharing that, dude. I'm going to I'm gonna look into this a little bit more because, yes, I am a total sucker for, for heist kind of movies. That sounds like something that might be right up my alley. So thank you for sharing that, my friend. Uh, all right. Christopher Chow writes, uh, one of two. Uh, John, uh, the day has finally come. Rise of Skywalker crosses the $1 billion mark. And, yet, and it has. It's now official. Rise of Skywalker has crossed the billion dollar mark, which means Disney officially now has $7 billion films under their belt in 2019. Incredible. Here's my list of the top billion dollar movies by Disney in 2019. Um, and we'll get back to an uh, to anonymous there. Uh, number one, Frozen 2. I did like Frozen 2 a lot. Number two, Aladdin. I loved Aladdin. Number three, Toy Story 4. I love that too. Number Number four, Endgame, fabulous. Number five, Rise of Skywalker. Number six, Lion King, which I loved more than most people did, I admit. Number seven, Captain Marvel. Honorable mention, uh, Far From Home, Spider-Man. I know you don't do lists, but just your thoughts on my list. Oh, I like it. I mean, I I would have probably Lion King a little bit higher just because, you know, more than I liked Lion King more than most people did. Um, I mean, what? A, look at that list. What a year. What a freaking year. And you know... I was talking to somebody from, from Disney the other day. And it's like, even they were saying like, this will never happen again. Like it'll never happen again that we're going to get like one studio, $7 billion films from one studio. Not going to happen again. I mean, what we just saw this year was such an anomaly. It is absolutely crazy. Um, what would be my number one on that list? My number one on that list might be actually toy story four. I think I'd put Toy Story 4 number one. I think I might have a Aladdin number two. Nah, maybe I'd have Lion King number two, then Aladdin, then Endgame, um, then probably Rise of Skywalker, and then probably Captain Marvel is probably how I would list it. And I, I, at very minimum, I like all those movies. Love a few of them, but I, at the very minimum, like all those movies. So, yeah, man, it's it's incredible when you think about it. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, an anonymous viewer wrote in, Hey, Aaron, uh, what time are the Eagles playing next Sunday? Oh, I think that was a little bit of a dig at Aaron there. I think it was a little bit of a dig at Aaron. Thank goodness she's not here to get your meanness. Uh, Eric uh, Hayden Eric writes, uh, in the case of Robert Downey Jr., I feel the longer the break, the longer the impact when he inevitably returns. Leave it, leave it a phase or two. Let's miss him for a while. Yeah, I mean, I don't see him coming back. That's why I always said, look, Robert Downey Jr. will be back as Iron Man. I, of that, I have zero doubt. But it doesn't mean it's going to be this year. It doesn't even mean it's going to be next year. It doesn't even mean it's going to be within the next three years. But he'll be back. And when Doolittle crashes and burns, um, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a monster flop, but I think it's going to. I think it's going to flop, but it won't be a monster flop. And then maybe his next film doesn't do so well. You'll see him coming back. Because uh, why not? He had a lot of fun doing those movies. People love him in those movies, and he loves being loved, just like every actor. Every actor loves being loved. All of us, not just actors. We all love being loved. Who doesn't love being loved? We all do. But I agree. It's not going to be anytime soon. It's it's not going to be anytime soon, but at some point you will. Maybe, you know, absence makes the heart go fonder, Hayden. So you're probably absolutely right about that. All right. Captain Confidence Entertainer writes, uh, Texans, the U.S. equivalent of good Canadian kids. Um, I don't know. Only a Texan can tell me if that's true or not. All right. Uh, Porkins McPorkster of <laughs> the name writes unpopular opinion. I 100% agree with Jack Hind on what he said about Collider. Collider became a total mess riddled with dumb people uh, like Roxy. D let's not be now. You, you, you lost me there. Uh, Isaac Beebe writes without John Williams, um, without John Williams, bikes don't really fly, nor do brooms and Quidditch matches, nor do men in red capes. There is no force. Dinosaurs do not walk the earth. We do not wonder. We do not weep. We do not believe Steven Spielberg. Oh, dude, that's such a powerful statement. And you know, what's really great. I was at um, every year. Ann and I go. John Williams does a concert every year at the Hollywood Bowl uh, called the Maestro of the Movies concert, which is basically celebrating the music of John Williams in the movies. 
And it's changed a little bit over the years, but at the end of the day, the heart of it is still John Williams coming out and conducting the orchestra to some of his, you know, most beloved movie themes. And not this year, but the previous year, Steven Spielberg was the special surprise guest. And Steven Spielberg came out and talked about John. And first of all, I was losing my mind because Steven Spielberg is, to me, my all-time favorite filmmaker. So Steven Spielberg is out there um, talking about uh, John Williams and all that kind of stuff. And um, and he was talking about um, the beginning of the third Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade. Because remember, that movie begins with uh, young Indiana Jones, played by River Phoenix, and the whole trying to get that thing from the uh, from the uh, Tomb Raiders and stuff like that. He goes, you want to see, Steven Spielberg says, if you want to see how much impact John Williams has on something, we're going to watch the opening five minutes of Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade without John Williams' music. And then we're going to watch it with John Williams' music. And they played the first five minutes of it without John Williams' music. And it is tough to watch. And Steven Spielberg comes out and goes, isn't that terrible? He goes, I directed that. And I'm going to tell you, that's terrible. It's terrible. Now, let's do it again with the music of John Williams. And they play it again with John Williams with the orchestra playing his theme over. He goes, all of a sudden, this scene has life and it's exciting. And it's all because of John Williams. It is absolutely incredible. And that's why Steven Spielberg and probably Steven and George are the biggest fans of John Williams, uh, as I'm sure a lot of us are as well. By the way, I mentioned with the billion dollar films, I said I liked all of them. That's obviously not true. One of them I don't like is The Rise of Skywalker. So that one I put at the end and I move Captain Marvel up one. Uh, So I liked all of them except for The Rise of Skywalker. So there's that one. Uh, All right. Uh, Jonathan Joyner writes. Uh, And we only got a few minutes left here, guys. Jonathan Joyner writes, Hey, John, so I finally bit the bullet and watched the Harley Quinn show, and I got to say I'm in love. Poison Ivy's nonchalant humor is one of the best parts for me. Next up, Doom Patrol, uh, Dat Bat Waxes. Listen, I'm telling you, I am really into this. And I'll tell you right now, I'm only a couple episodes in. Ivy is my favorite character in the show. I, they, I I don't know why, but Ivy, I think it's exactly the way her, her nonchalant humor. I think that's a great way to put it, Jonathan. I am absolutely loving that character. She's my favorite part of the show. I dig her so much. So I'm totally in agreement with you on that. All right. Devontae Brown writes, a bummer. Looks like Mindhunter's never coming back, especially after this new story with the actors being released and Fincher supposedly uh, not uh, as into it. I, I Listen, I just have no idea how this happens. I have no idea how this happens. You've got to have a succession plan. Like hell, even when I was with AMC, I had a succession plan. It was very simple. My succession plan was a person named Dennis Zen. That was my succession plan. Like even I had a plan for what happens to AMC Movie News if I depart. Well, we've got, we're all set because Dennis Zen is there. Dennis Zen is there. Everything will be fine. So even I, an idiot, had a succession plan. You know, uh, Steve Jobs, in his famous final letter to the board of Apple just before he passed away, he mentioned it is time to execute the the succession plan where power transferred to Tim Cook. He was prepared. He understood. He needed to have his company keep going, and they had a plan for what happens if he's not there. He had a succession plan. You have a show like Mindhunter, you got to have a succession plan. Okay, what happens if David's not here? What happens if he doesn't want to do another season or he gets busy? You've got to be prepared for that. And they clearly weren't. And it's really unfortunate to see. It's very, very unfortunate to see. Uh, Anyway, uh, Drew H. writes, My top 10 comic book movies in no particular order. uh, Endgame, Infinity War, Civil War, Winter Soldier, Man of Steel, Logan, Dark Knight, X-Men Days Future Past, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers. Dude, that's, I mean, that's, listen to those films. Listen to those films. Dark Knight, Man of Steel, Endgame, Infinity War, Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, X-Men Days of Future Past, Winter Soldier, Civil War. I mean, these are all comic book movies we've gotten in just the last handful of years. Like, we are truly living right now in the golden age of comic book movies. 
The people are going to look back at this age of comic book movies that we just got to live through and go, wow, what a time that would have been. What a time that would have been. Uh, so just all, and, and you know what? And there's probably eight or nine or 10 others that could have been on your list, Drew. Eight or nine or 10 others could have been on your list and it would still blow our minds. That's how good we've got it right now. That's how good we've had it lately. All right. Uh, Kenneth Colton writes, happy Friday, Gio. Thank you so much. Uh, I watched the the Robert Downey Jr. interview, and for me, it seems he's very reluctant to come back. Uh, always a possibility, but it ended so well. And also, who's your pick for USC 246? I think McGregor. Again, like I said before, I'm going to be cheering for Cowboy, but I do think McGregor wins the fight, unfortunately. But it's going to be a very, very exciting fight. You know, yeah, he did, but then he was on that other talk show where he was pretty noncommittal about not coming back. Uh, he goes, who knows? We'll see. I mean, there's this and this. We'll see. Listen, I I 100% believe he's coming back. You guys know this. I've believed this. I've believed this for a while. I 100% believe that he is coming back. Not this year, not next year, maybe not within three years, but he'll be back. And I think you know, when you get movies like Doolittle coming out and it's falling on its face, then and by the way, I don't know, maybe the movie makes 100 million opening weekend. We'll find out in a few days. But it's not it's in my opinion it's not a good film. But you know, it's that can be jarring for anybody. You know, you do one project and everybody loves you. You do another project and everybody hates that project. What are you going to want to do? Well, you're going to want to go back to the project that everybody loved. I mean, that's just human, isn't it? Isn't that just human? Wouldn't I be like that? Wouldn't you be like that? So, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Because he did sound kind of one way um, on the podcast, but he sounded another way. Again, he just, he just gave more wiggle room to it. And with Doolittle, and if he has another one that doesn't do well, I think you'll see him have more enthusiasm about going back. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Kenneth Cole also writes, uh, happy Thursday. Damn, sleep schedule. <laughs> LOL, no problem, man. Uh, B. Ryan writes, the MCU should keep making new heroes and icons. I agree, but it should be done in balance. What you don't do is stop making recognizable heroes to just make all new ones. You have to you have to have it be a process. Do three recognizable heroes and one new one. Do three recognizable hero movies and then a new one. Then do two recognizable movies and a new one. And then three recognizable movies and a new one. And you you play to the strengths that you have while starting to pepper in all the new stuff and you've seen that that's what they're doing. Cuz this next phase We've got Eternals, we got Shang-Chi, but we also have another Doctor Strange. We also have another Thor. We're also going to have, you know, uh, 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 Falcon and Winter Soldier. We're also going to have, you know, uh, Scarlet Witch. We're also, so, and we're also going to have Hawkeye. So they're doing, we got a Black Widow movie. So we're, they're dropping in new things like She-Hulk and Moon Knight while also doing recognizable things. And that's the process. That's the balance. As long as you keep doing that, you're probably going to be okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Kenneth Colton writes, uh, and this will be our last question today, guys. A uh, happy Thursday, Geo. Clearly kind of sent this in yesterday. Uh, you have said that Robert Downey Jr. will return as Iron Man at some point. 100%. I watched his interview and he seems reluctant uh, as his arc ended perfectly. Oh, and what's your, you, I believe we already kind of addressed that, Kenneth. So we'll just go on. To, we, I, we actually just addressed that specifically. So we'll go on and take uh, one more from 50 Shades of Geek who writes, I woke up and saw the headline, Marvel cancels Hawkeye series. I said to myself, it's probably an unsubstantiated rumor for an anonymous Reddit user. And John is going to dismiss it on his show. Was I right? I have heard no legitimate. All I can say is I've heard no legitimate source saying that whatsoever. So. Uh, I've heard nothing to to confirm that. Uh, so we'll just go on and we'll take Ben Hayusa. Ben Hayusa writes, uh, how's it going, John? It's been going pretty well. Been a while. Just want to say RIP to The Rock's father, uh, Rocky Soulman Johnson, who passed away yesterday. I, I was so sad to hear that. Now, he was a wrestler who was before my time watching wrestling, but he had just missed before my time when I was watching wrestling. So I would see like, older matches they would do reruns of that and i would see you know uh rocky johnson doing he was a big man oh dude he was a big man um so yeah it really, it really was sad to hear that um uh, that his father had passed away and ben also writes this will be our last question today guys ben also writes and love that Morbius trailer, by the way, and seeing Bad Boys and Doolittle doubleheader this weekend. I'm here, like, I didn't go to the Bad Boys press screening, but I'm hearing pretty good things about it. 
I'm hearing pretty good things about the new Bad Boys. Last I checked, it was sitting at 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. 75%. Let me pull this up here. Uh, Bad Boys for life. Uh, oop, I actually wrote for lice. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Let's see where it is right now. Because if you had told me it was going to be at 75%, I, yeah, it's still sitting at 75%, which is really quite good. So I, honestly, though, dude, if you had to skip one, I would probably suggest skipping um, the one to skip would probably be do little. But hey, if, if it's intrigued you and it looks good to you, go give it a shot. But I was just be known it's it's a little bit disappointing. All right, guys, for everybody else who has sent in questions from Fifty Shades, uh, Fabian, uh, Ant Banks, nineteen eighty four, uh, Gronagor, and all the way up, do not worry. Your questions are going to get answered. A bunch of them are going to get answered in a companion video a little bit later today, and the rest will pick up on the next John Campus show. You sent in those questions; they're going to get answered on this show uh, or in a video, one way or the other. So there's that. All right, guys, that will do it. For today's installment of the John Campia Show, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks to Robert Meyer Burnett for being here and bringing all of his glorious, verisimil glorious verisimilitude to the show. And a special thank you to all of you guys. Uh, thank you so much for sending in the questions and watching the show and for sending in the questions for two reasons. Number one, you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported the channel while you were doing it. And all of us here on the John Campia YouTube channel, thank you very much for that. Uh, all right, guys. I hope you have a glorious weekend set up in front of all of y'all. I hope you have some great fun or relaxing time, whatever it is that you need right now at the moment. Keep your guys' eyes open once again for the companion video coming a little bit later, either today or tomorrow. We're going to get that up. And that will do it, guys, for today's show. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. My name is John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.